How's it going everyone? Welcome to Reef Builders video. I'm Jake Adams and uh, since it's the end of the year, I wanted to take an opportunity to discuss some of the best aquarium stories that we re-featured on Reef Builders over the last year. Now, uh, every year there's uh, several different categories of aquarium stories that you guys particularly like. And um, uh, in previous years, I've just kind of broken these down into a uh, combined uh, blog post on the website. And uh, just to do something a little bit different, to switch it up, I wanted to uh, have a little bit more of an informal discussion with you guys and uh, just freestyle chat about some of the stories that uh, you guys liked, shared, and commented the most over the last year. So first up is the madness of Photoshop corals. The aquarium hobby is one where, you know, we can't get together like with a car club and bring our aquariums and show them off and tear them around the racetrack or whatever. And so we really, as aquarists, rely on the internet to share our stories through digital photographs. The problem with that is that uh, all digital photographs are a representation of what our aquariums are really about. And uh, depending on your settings, depending on your lighting, and especially your post-processing, uh, your corals rarely look uh, on the monitor the same as they do in real life. Definitely the, any picture that you see online, if that coral uh, looks too good to be true, uh, definitely take it with a grain of salt. And uh, you know, I, I'm as guilty as the next person. I want my coral pictures to look good and uh, it's just human nature to uh, make these as flattering as possible um, when I edit them and put them online. I try to keep them uh, realistic, um, but you know, I want the coral pictures to look as good as possible, so. Next up, the decline of the local fish store. Now, I kind of rebooted this channel with a, a tour of the best local fish stores, at least four of them in the Denver area, so you know how I feel about local fish stores. I feel like it's one of the most important um, aspects of the marine aquarium hobby. It was the first place where the marine aquarium community really started before t clubs, the local clubs, you know, kind of took over. You know, it's it's up to the uh, reef aquarists to go into their fish stores and uh, support their fish stores. But really, the uh, the store owners need to constantly be improving their stores, getting exciting livestock, having special events, and uh, more or less just finding ways to engage the local marine aquarium community and encourage them to uh, come into the shop. Next up, why is the aquarium hobby so addicting? And to me, this is an easy one. Uh, the Humans love collecting things. We love collecting stamps and coins and uh, virtual currency and, you know, uh, Pokemon that don't even exist are completely intangible. And so it's just very natural for uh, us people to want to collect corals. And uh, that's what's particularly cool about the aquarium hobby. No matter what you're into, there's always a huge diversity of corals that you can pick from, uh, from zoanthids to mushrooms, LPS corals, SPS. You can collect different types of algae, different types of rare fish. And so the aquarium hobby is just ready made to be collectible um, in whatever group of animals you are into. I'm really glad that Mike was the one to write about the nano bubbles in the reef aquarium hobby. Uh, in earlier this year, I think in the echo chamber of uh, some of the social media platforms, especially Facebook, these micro bubbles uh, injection into your aquarium uh, really got a lot of attention. And, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty much on the sidelines about this. Yes, there are parts of the reef that have uh, lots of fine bubbles, but for the most part, where you find corals, there's no micro bubbles in the water. Um, Really, it, this just reminds me of all these funky techniques that people try to come into, that try to do trademark them. Shame on you, micro scrubbing nano bubbles, TM, it's not even registered. Anyway, um, just keep a clean tank, you know, do your water changes, clean your protein skimmer, use a mechanical filter, change out some carbon once in a while, and just keep it simple, stupid. Like, that's all it takes to keep a nice, healthy reef tank. And, uh, you know, if you have the fundamentals down and you're not getting anywhere, you know, you need to just reevaluate the basics. 
One of the biggest categories of your favorite aquarium stories this year easily was all the reef tanks. Mike Paletta shared a really cool story on the Masterpiece Aquarium of David Saxby. This tank has been going for several years. Um, I think it's upwards of 2,000 gallons. Not quite sure on the volume of that one, but that's a really cool story that you should check out. Um, I also shared the Supernatural Reef Tank of Seabox Aquarium and bar none, this was one of the coolest reef tanks I've ever seen in my life. You know, I walked in and it, the thing was just like a living masterpiece. Um, that was clearly one of the best reef tanks I've seen in Europe. But uh, right up behind it was the uh, huge visual update of six meter Peter's 20 foot reef tank. I've just seen this aquarium in Holland uh, a few different times and just that convex huge glass pane with all the room for the corals to grow, for the fish to swim, is just uh, you know something that has to be seen to, believe, to be believed. Uh, we've shared this story several times over the years, but it seems like you know every 12 to 18 months we've got something new to say about it and you guys really enjoy this, so uh, definitely check out that story. Another subcategory of reef tanks that you guys really appreciated was some of the highly engineered reef tanks. And I'm talking about the Masterpiece Aquariums from Sea Dreams. Um, man, these guys take a combination of off-the-shelf parts and some custom-made work of their own, and they put it together in such an artistic design. Before the aquarium is even set up, you know, a real reef aquarium Hobbyists will look at it and drool. These aquariums by Sea Dreams are super duper cool. I, we don't really have a parallel here in North America, so uh, definitely hats off to Sea Dreams. And uh, Wesley Vrieswick, I hope I said that right, um, I got to see his reef tank in person in Holland. And this was one of the most beautiful reef tanks I've seen ever. The aquascape inside, the layout of the reef aquarium equipment in the sump, uh, just from top to bottom. This was an amazing reef tank. Uh, this guy used uh, some of the best uh, reef aquarium equipment known to man, and he's definitely a control freak, so it's all hooked up with the Neptune Systems Apex controller. You know, it's not for everyone, but Wesley is an elevator repair technician, so that falls right in line with his job description. So you definitely want to check that reef tank out. On one end of the spectrum, the Tyson Reef Tank up in the, the mountains was a really beautiful reef tank that I enjoyed because it used just a couple basic radion lights, a couple MP10s on a four foot tank, and just the resulting aquarium that has been going for over about 15 years is just, uh, you know, it's what people aspire to. And uh, another aquarium that I've actually featured uh, several times uh, on Reef Builders is the giant hammer coral at Neptune's Tropical Fish in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. This tank is four feet long, three feet wide, and I think two feet or 30 inches tall. And the whole aquascape is one giant hammer coral. This hammer coral is, uh, is famous here in the local area. Every time somebody comes to visit, I take them to go see this coral because it's just such a beautiful specimen. And it's been growing since the mid 90s. So this 20 year old plus uh, hammer coral has been uh, growing in captivity longer than most people have had a reef tank. So it's clear that you guys love the reef aquarium displays. I'm gonna do my best to cover some more in the coming year. But another uh, writing topic, article, category that you really love and I really love is all the captive breeding stories. Uh, the juggalo clownfish from Sea and Reef Aquaculture. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing clownfish. I think it was going by the name of Super Da Vinci Clownfish. I'm not sure if Sea and Reef uh, eventually settled on a name, but the funky white uh, facial markings of uh, this clownfish really looks like a juggalo and the juggalo clowns. Regardless of what you think of Insane Clown Posse, you can't deny that the white markings on the juggalo clownfish really does look like the white face paint that uh, the juggalos and juggalites like to wear. And uh, I just think it's a fun name and an amazing clownfish. And I can't wait to see more of them from Sea and Reef Aquaculture. Every year seems to bring with it some cool new clownfish stories. And uh, right there with the Juggalo clownfish was the electric tail clownfish from Bali Aqua Rich. And uh, you know, I'm sure that the seasoned reefers and those of us who have seen a lot of different clownfish have seen this um, artifact where sometimes there's kind of like a bluish greenish glow, uh, usually towards the tail of the clownfish. Uh, Bali Aqua Rich showed off one that had a particularly brilliant uh, green tail. And right after we shared that story, uh, I heard from ORA and they shared some pictures of their blue tailed clownfish. 
And uh, they've worked with them a little bit, but they've had some challenges in trying to amplify that particular trait in the clownfish. So uh, maybe this is a new trait that we'll be able to see in future domesticated strains of clownfish in the future. But uh, it's just nice to know there's some cool new things on the horizon. The captive breeding of the blue tangs was clearly one of the biggest stories of the year. Um, hopefully what was learned about breeding this fish will be shared with the wider public, but uh, a company in Asia, we're not sure where, has already started releasing some regal blue tangs of their own. Uh, interestingly enough, captive bred blue tangs uh, actually made it to sea dwelling creatures uh, a few weeks ago, but they were not related to this success at the rising tide. So uh, we hopefully, I hope to see a lot more uh, captive bred blue tangs next year. I still haven't seen any for myself, but hopefully these will be of high quality and uh, just provide a sustainable form of this fish for the aquarium market. Not captive bred, but tank raised purple tangs from Sri Lanka was another story that you guys really enjoyed. And uh, this is a really sustainable way to provide uh, live fish for the aquarium hobby. Because when baby fish uh, first settle out on the reef, you know, there's a very high attrition rate. And what that means is that, you know, if you have a hundred little baby purple tangs at half an inch and you come back a month later and there's only 50 at one inch, half of those purple tangs got eaten or consumed or died for some reason. So actually collecting these fish when they're small and growing them out in captivity is probably just as beneficial as captive breeding them uh, from scratch. So this is a story that you guys really liked and uh, I liked it too. So I don't want to get into the aquarium products too much because I have a separate story uh, in the works just for that. Um, there was a lot of crowdfunded products, uh, a lot of new devices. Uh, we still didn't really see the Mindstream get released at all. Uh, the fish bit was released in small quantities, but uh, they haven't really made a big impact. But the one cool story that you guys really loved was the Moai Robotic Aquarium Glass Cleaner and Camera. So. Like I said, with electronics, you know, all the sensors and microprocessors are getting smaller all the time. And so it's getting increasingly uh, easy to put together products um, with electronics that are off the shelf and rapid prototyping to develop really cool new devices like this Moai Robotic Aquarium Glass Cleaner. I haven't seen it in action yet. I'm not sure that they've been released, but uh, basically it's a kind of like a small, uh, aquarium glass cleaner that moves across your tank and one side uh, actually has a camera built in to basically point the camera roll anywhere in your aquarium. So that's super cool. I can't wait to see the Moai. And uh, along those same lines, several of our aquarium specific webcam stories were very well received by you guys. So um, really, really cool to see such uh, innovation in the marine aquarium space. And I uh, can't wait to see what 2017 brings. So again, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the Marine Aquarium products, but I put together a couple different uh, top tens on the blog that you guys really resonated with. And uh, one of these was the top 10 most overpriced reef aquarium products. And um, it's no secret that the marine aquarium hobby is a very expensive one to partake in. And uh, there's a few items that I had to call out for just being ridiculously expensive. Um, just like the micro scrubbing nano bubbles. Just keep your tank reef, your reef tank uh, clean, keep it simple, uh, stick to your foundations, you know, and sometimes there's certain products that uh, are priced more for craftsmanship and quality than uh, overall performance. So when you see some of these products that seem to have an extra zero or two at the end, uh, you know, definitely take a look around and see what you could do better. On the flip side, I put together a top 10 great legacy aquarium products that are still being sold. And these are some aquarium devices that have been around for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they're put out by companies that have been around forever. And these are some of the products that just keep going and going and going. So uh, yeah, definitely take a look at that story to see what uh, some of these foundation products 
uh, that are still in the Aquarium Hobby R, and these will help uh, educate you and guide you on the types of products that you should be considering for your reef aquarium. So I started out last year in Indonesia and we traveled all over the place to Raja Ampa, to Sumbawa, to Jakarta, and we got to see a lot of really cool uh, corals both in the wild and in the process of being farmed, being collected. And one of your favorite stories was the Indonesia travelogue that Nikki wrote about how corals get from farm to tank. And this is kind of like the farm to table movement. Uh, you know, we're really trying to do our best to track down and to link you guys up with where our corals are coming from, you know, what companies, what communities, what families are basically making a living by sustainably harvesting and farming corals. So definitely check out that story on how corals get from farm to tank. Also, while I was in Jakarta, I got to see the bounce shrooms at the beginning, and it was kind of crazy to see how much these pseudo bounce uh, Rhodactus were selling for at the exporter before we made it to the wholesaler, before it made it to the retailer. And uh, some of these have a lot of potential, but I think that the supply has finally caught up. And so hopefully in 2017, we're gonna see a lot more diversity and a lower cost on some of these fancy bullseye mushrooms, which are not quite bounce mushrooms, but have the potential to become so. And finally, one of my favorite stories was kind of a feel-good one, is a story of a giant pearl that weighed about 75 pounds was discovered in the Philippines. Crazy enough, this giant pearl was made by a giant clam, and you can see the outlines of this pearl and picture how it rested on the inside of a Tridacna gigas clam and the folds that it formed. And uh, you know, really adding to the story is that this uh, giant pearl was collected or, or harvested by a fisherman. I can't remember if the clam was alive or not, I don't think so, but he actually kept it under his bed for 10 years. Do you know how big a 75 pound pearl is? It's about this big, you know, it's a two headed thing, 75 pounds. And so this is one of the most, uh, the biggest pearls ever found. And interestingly enough, prior to the, uh, release of the information on this giant pearl, uh, the previous record holder had actually been found from this part of the Philippines, which I believe was Palawan. So that was just a short overview of some of the best stories over the last year, but it is not all of them. So what I'm gonna do is put together a post on Reef Builders and uh, put together all of the best stories. I think there's about 20 or 25 of them. And uh, the link to that post will be in the description. So if you like these stories or you want to see some of the others that I did didn't quite have time to discuss, definitely check out the link in the description uh, and check out the post that will have all the stories listed uh, so you can read further about all of these um, different topics that I've discussed. So there you have it, you guys. That was some of the best aquarium stories that we shared with you on reefbuilders.com over the last year. Uh, please let us know, please let me know what you like the most in the comments. Tell me in the comments which stories were your favorite and what kind of stories you want me to bring to the website and to the YouTube channel uh, more in the future. So if you like what you see, definitely hit that like button. I got a lot of cool videos in the pipeline over the next few days, so it's gonna be very happening here. Definitely hit that subscribe button because you're not going to want to miss all the cool stuff we're going to be sharing. I hope everybody is uh, working up to having a fabulous New Year's Eve celebration and we'll catch you guys on the next one.